Oh, sorry. Just got a notice from another automation I have that lineups were available for Pickleball, so I had to jump in there. But that's the fun part of all of this. You can start using these automations by N8N or whatever. No code for all of these little things that are just fun to do. In this one, though, I'm going to go into the back end work that I did on this vectorize chart data. And what was really cool about this, in my opinion, for workflow and our needs here, is that the user who is doing some of the data gathering can just go to these different pages and take screenshots. And then they take those screenshots and send them to the back end. So in this particular case, in this video that you watched before this, because that's where you learned about this, so hopefully you watched this video first, you can see me chatting with this data. Now, how this works, I'm going to go into details, is that the person goes to a particular website, uh, could be any of these charts or data, they can then take a screenshot with an extension called Go Full Page. Let me just see. Yeah, that's the name of it. So basically at this point, they can take a screenshot of that page and download it. So let me see if, let me run that again. And let me do the dashboard analytics and then go full page. And then it goes down the page and does a big screenshot. That one's not that big, but some of them are long. And then we save them as a PDF. Or maybe an image we'll see in a moment i can't remember but that doesn't matter because we're gonna go dig in and then we save it and then upload it to process it now again this could be even easier you could save it to a google drive folder and it would parse it from there just iterate time so let's dig into how that becomes chattable data really easily but there's a lot of little detail touches here and when i say easy I mean, sometimes that's based off of years of experience of trying to code all this and build all this so these details that might seem complex, you're going to see over time become easier and easier. So what took me hours to do gets to be just a few clicks or now a copy. So what we're going to do is go look at this particular. So here's the chat UI, but here is how the data got into the vector store. So let's dig into that. Now, this is page one of two. The person can upload a particular that file into the form. And then the form will save it to the disk. From here, uh, it's pretty simple. It just saves it down to the disk and it gives it the file name. From here, I then just grab that file name for easier reference later on. And I should get better at renaming these, but I'll cover that. I'm just going to get better at that. And then it executes another workflow. So that's what we're going to dig into now. And that's where things get really tricky. Now, that other workflow... Um, is where it comes in, and we'll do some stuff here. Now, <clears throat> we could hit this workflow with a webhook. I don't want to go into that right now, but again, it's just an API. You give it binary data, and it will do its thing. And this will, this workflow will show me using one workflow for either the form or for someone sending it via the API, which I'll get into as I start to build UIs for this um, in Lovable. So in this case, the uh, the the, I generate a UUID. So here I was kind of easy. I didn't use the uh, tools that Node has. And I just generate a string that I can reference throughout this process. And later on, that string just comes in handy. And so <clears throat> one of the tutorials or one of the lessons I saw does this as well. And as a programmer, it's just something you think about, is I want these consistent variables I can use throughout this particular workflow. So I'll start to surface them. In this case, I said UUID, output name, file name. So I don't want to do that everywhere. I want to create this once and then use it in other places. So that was kind of establishing that variable. And again, then we use the if statement. So the if statement, which we could have used a switch for routing, but in this case, we're just saying, hey, was this from the workflow trigger? Yes or no exists. So if that doesn't exist, then it's uh, false. So if form upload true. So I try to name this so that the true lines up with the name of the node. True form upload. So now, if it's true, we then take that file, we upload it. So remember, we put this file on a server, uh, on the server that N8N is running on. <clears throat> and I'm not sure when you host with N8N how that works. I'm hosting my own. I'm sure they have an option as well, but you could use S3 or anything really uh, in that case, or DigitalOcean, I have a video on that. As I said, we wrote that to the disk, and here we're going to go read that from the disk. 
So here we're going to say, you know, go into that folder, get that file name and move it to this new UUID string. Now, this is an interesting one because I didn't use the, uh, the field here. I just used the random string. And uh, this guy, I'm not sure why I didn't. I should, oh, because it's after this. I should have done this before. I don't want to fix it live. But so now this system says, okay, I'm going to move the file over to a name I understand. It's the UUID. And then it's going to, whether we now came from the file upload form or eventually the API, which says later on, it says, hey, I know you've uploaded this. I know we put this on the disk at some particular uh, location. And so we'll go into this one next time. This one, I'm still, it works, but I'm still working on the details there. So now the file name, we have these variables and we can go to the next one where then, uh, again, I just say, hey, ChatGPT, I need to do this thing. And I give ChatGPT, or Claude, actually. Uh, actually, ChatGPT has been doing better for uh, N8N for me. I don't know why. So I say, okay, here's what I'm trying to do. I have stuff in a folder. When you go get those files from the folder, I want to iterate over them and then rename them and run Poplar on them. What I forgot to really emphasize here is... Why am I not just doing OCR? Why am I not just taking that PDF and doing OCR with it? And this is actually a big deal and it's cool. When I asked the vision image analyzer to look at this image, my prompt can ask for more than OCR. It can have it read the charts to help it surface some information and make it more chattable. I could in that prompt say, if you see a chart, summarize some of the data, surface some of the dates, so then when I go to chat with that later on, it can chat with that data. So I know there are ways to take PDFs and break them up and then see the charts and then put those charts through another processor so that it becomes data that you can look at or ask about. But in this case, I can just take the PDF and have it surface the text and surface the charts into a way that's very friendly to chat with. And, uh, and, and then when I run Poplar, um, I want to take that PDF and, and, and convert it uh, to PNG. I could have just sent them in as PNG. I don't know why I didn't. That's another thing I would just keep reiterating. But that is an option as well. I think either way, these are going to be long files because that application doesn't break things up by page. So it's really, it's funny. I'm not sure the advantage here. Starting with PNG, renaming these things so it's consistent once they come in would have the same value here. So something to rethink about as I go through this again. So now we then said, okay, this code's going to iterate over those files, rename them as we output them consistently so that we have the input and the output as the PNG. Again, could have been avoided if we just did PNG to start with. I think I had some trouble with the PNG generation, but that extension was doing, but I can't remember. And I think that was it. So ChatGPT helped me figure out how to do that, how to iterate over those files, how to then turn them into PNG using a local Poplar command on the server. There was some gotchas here. Like I had to learn how to set the environment variable for N8N so that it would allow me to run some particular node stuff that was globally installed. In this case, I ended up just using Poplar that's on the server because it was a lot easier and it worked. So then I go back and I just move these files. So I just get all the, sorry, I read all the files from that particular folder because again, I'm consistently moving them into the UUID folder. I'm consistently, they're PNGs. So I'm saying, hey, let's go read all of those. And then we loop over them. And then as we loop over them, I can start handing them to OpenAI. And this is where it gets more exciting. And we'll go look at a passive execution after we're done, because that's always helpful. Then we go to OpenAI and we say, okay, here are those files. Here's a sense of where the data is coming from. So this, this prompt can obviously be better. Most prompts sh that are this short, you're really, you're really shooting a line in some ways. Or you're, take time, make a good prompt. Use Claude or ChatGPT to make a good prompt. Tell it what you're trying to do, give it what you're thinking, and, and it will extend it. But in this case, um, I'm just letting it know the data is coming from these places. So as you look at it, try to help me consider some things. Now, later on, I'll show something where I'm, I'm going to do some preemptive like data saving so I can show like, hey, you're trending up, you're trending down. These are the categories. But for now, I didn't get to that part yet. So we give the data to OpenAI 
And then when OpenAI is done with that particular file, it gives it to the super base vector store. Again, it's just a Postgres vector store, but um, it has some of the super base extra around it. And as I mentioned in the other video, I had to run, let's see if I saved that one. Sorry about that. Let me see if I got that. Yep. I had to run some insert statements and alter statements to, from here to help get that going. So this template helped me to get that one going. And basically when I did do it with Postgres, it was a little easier overall, but that got me going here if I remember right there. So now I point it to the particular table that I've used for this, that I set up for this. And if we go look at that super base, let me grab that. Oops, let me move that over into a tab. And let's go to here. And let's go to tables, analytics. So at that point, and this will all be part of the code I drop into the folder for those of you who have gotten access to this. I'll export the schema from the database. Um, you have that. Now, <clears throat> the uh, does it set this up for me. And that's the nice part about NAN. -N. It, it builds out a lot of the structure for you. <clears throat> Where it does the embedding, the metadata, and the content. So what happened here was once I set that up with its help, I added this. Now there's no like magic here. I didn't know, like I just pressed on this and it gave me, it limits your options, which is very helpful. And then I knew but from previous coding efforts, you know, what this was about and could have used local Olama, which is a nice way to save money. If you had a ton of data that you just had to embed, you could push this all to Superbase and be done. But this is not, this is more dynamic data. But if someone had a library of thousands of uh, data sets that weren't going to change. Now, again, let me get rid of this. It said, okay, well, you have to attach this. And so when I did that, it gave me two options. Now the GitHub one I've never used before. It looks kind of interesting. I knew to use this one from the video, from that uh, template. And then this guy was pretty, I just left it alone. And then we get into this one where it's about how do we want to chunk the data? So let me delete that. And so it gave me a few options. I went with the, uh, this guy here because the recursive character text splitter and well, cause it's recommended for most use cases, but you really could go into depth here and learn these things. And like I say in the video, like I've built this, I had Olama or Laralama, which was a Laravel version of this or trying to be, so I understand the complexity that goes into coding this and I'm glad I don't have to code it every time. I'm glad I don't have to install a library every time or plug everything in cause it's not that easy. And no matter how you package it, it's still hard. So in this case, the recursive one just helps us to chunk up the text a bit with a little bit of overlap if we want. Uh, and so then we start to turn this data into chattable data. Now let's go look at, let me grab my notes and then let's go look at the, uh, this area here. And then we'll go look at the execution. So, so we can just see it working. So the summarization or segmentation of the data is going to be another part to this. Um, and it could be triggered off an event in Superbase. It could happen. I want it to happen right away, but if you start to keep your workflow small and separated, you can make them a little bit more robust. Um, you can have them happen in parallel. You can have them happen later on. In this case, it's here because I was working on it and I didn't quite like how it was going. Um, but the goal is this, if at the end of processing this file, I can then have ChatGPT summarize the data. Say, Hey, tell me this, Tell me the subscribers. What's the total? Did it go up or down? So I can end up with structured output like this. Then I can make those charts that we're all used to when you land on a dashboard that say 150 trending up, 200 trending down. So I could do that ahead of time. So where when this is done processing and the person lands on that dashboard, they can see data right away. And that's really nice. And I just didn't push it far enough. I didn't finish it. I am going to build the UI and lovable. I am going to make all of that. It's going to be part of the training course. And that will be just part of these more private videos as you sign up for the newsletter. All right. So now that we have a sense of all the work that went into this, again, people might say, well, I could have coded that quicker. Maybe, but I could duplicate this and be done. And now I could do the next project and the next project. And this is being used, this particular template I'm using in one other project already and more to come for different specific use cases. Cause now I might want to analyze some other data. 
it's just once you keep going with this and once you build with it, it becomes quicker and more repeatable and more shareable and supportable because now I can come in if there's a problem. Now, I made this thing called uh, in settings, and this is really nice. I made this uh, error workflow. So if there is an error with this, it will slack me. Again, just so easy, right? And let's go save that because I want to save that setting. But let's go look at past executions, okay? Now, what we'll do, let's uh, copy this into the editor. And I don't mind lo losing my pins. But again, this came in, had some results, a file name I sent as a PDF. And then it made the UID, no big deal there, no big deal here. Um, this one, it has exit code zero, and it just took that and made it into a uh, unique. They renamed the file to be the UUID. And then we get to the more interesting part where we pass opening eye the data, and then it gives me a uh, summary of that data. We then loop over that and just store it away. I don't know if we can dig in as deep to see what a chunk looked like. I don't know if that's really just a chunk. It could be. Uh, yeah, zero and one. That's cool. All right. But you can kind of, even if I did code this, I would never get to this level of, of execution detail. Like pff, by the time you did that, you've, I just, the game's over, right? And, and that's it. So that shows you how it works. That shows you how I got data into there, how I use the vector system to basically later on make it searchable so that when we chat with it, just so you can see, and this is, uh, this is more basic rag stuff. When we chat with it, we are vectorizing our question, then searching for like vectors and then returning those. So the LLM can say, okay, here's my context. Here is that moment where you're saying, hey, LLM, don't hallucinate, use this particular content. Say you don't know if the content's not rich enough or giving you enough information. And that's where you <clears throat> get into the skill of having non-hallucinating proper chat systems. Yeah, so that, that brings it all together. That's how I got that data into the system. That's how we can send the data there. Now, again, save it to, next step, save it to a Google Drive folder, let it all process automatically because then it didn't, We'll just be looking at that folder. So this will get easier and easier. One day I'll set up something so I can get to the APIs. I'm not even sure if I can, but if I took that time, then I could get this from the API or I could, yeah, I, I, that would ideally they have an API. I haven't really looked deep enough into it, but I didn't see anything quick in any end and I haven't written anything for it. But we can now do LinkedIn. We can now do uh, Twitter. We can now do other things, Blue Sky and see, and we put all that into a bucket of that vector data and then we can start asking questions even better we can just have it say listen here's your latest data here's the questions you keep asking let me just push those out to slack for you let me let everybody know what's going on today uh, and then ask questions if you want all right so yeah that's about it for this one it's a lot there i'm going to share in the links below the json structure for all of these workflows and then i will uh, get the database schema which i think it built for me so you can see how that looks as well. And you can start to build this type of backend as needed for yourself. All right, uh, join the newsletter, get more updates like this, get more of these deep dives, subscribe and share the channel. And again, I mentioned the course earlier in, the, in a little blurb there. Just make sure to really consider that. It will really bring this stuff to you so you can start thinking how to build things in a different way. And in, there's a lot of skill and experience here on my end as a developer to help make NNM more simple but robust at that level because I'm bringing in years of that development mindset. All right. Thank you.